Good evening, everybody. Together with my co-moderators, Dr. G. N. Ramesh and Dr. Jayanti, a warm welcome to the third IBD Masterclass at IBD ENC. We are honored to have with us leading global IBD stalwarts for today's very important and relevant session. Over the next one and a half hours, we will be covering the entire spectrum of IBD and COVID-19, including vaccination. We actually did conduct a survey for all registered uh, delegates to find out about their awareness and um, idea about how to manage COVID and IBD. Can I have the slides, please? And it was actually very interesting. We had more than 25 countries from where we got the results. And what we found was that there was so much confusion. Even simple things. How many IBD patients do you see a month? Almost all were gastroenterologists who had filled up the uh, performers. And majority were seeing around about 4 to 10 patients per day. Most actually encountered patients with IBD. Next slide. But if you see, the, when they are coming to, which of the following is not a risk factor for acquiring COVID infection? We are all over with different colors um, again and again. The next slide. Restarting immunosuppressives. Resume within three days. Once there is improvement, resume therapy when there is TB-PCR negative. Again, if you see, there are multicolored and equal distribution, meaning thereby there's no clarity as to what should be the best approach. There is a need to understand more. Even in the vaccination, can we have the next slide? Yes. So even COVID-19 vaccination, people are not aware whether the efficacy of biologics uh, or uh, efficacy of vaccination is reduced when there is biologics, what really happens and whether all vaccinations can be given. So on this background, today's meeting is actually a very important and relevant one for the times today. As always, before we begin the academic feast, uh, we have a cultural exchange and the country for today is Sri Lanka and I have a very prominent IBD ENC member, young gastroenterologist with brilliance for IBD at Sri Lanka. He is from the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Over to you Nilesh. Okay, thank you, Rupa. Um, is my slides being seen by everybody? Or? Yes, we can see. Right, okay. So, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Rupa and also congratulate Rupa for, uh, and uh, the team at AHG, including uh, Dr. Reddy, for uh, initiating this IBD ENC, which is obviously recognized that IBD in this area is different. And the short segment that we always have during our monthly updates, as I kind of even highlighted that, we, even within our member countries, RBD is currently 
slight or slight different manage different facilities are different so i think uh, uh, congratulations to all of all, all of you all especially to rupa the the live by behind ibdnc so let me start off by uh, saying are you born uh, this traditional sri lankan way which is uh, basically saying uh, long life a uh, bit about sri lanka we have about 22 million people in our country uh, land extent is about 65000 uh, square kilometers or you know it's, it's an island small island we are multicultural multi ethnic uh, we have multiple religions uh, about 70% of our current, uh, population is single buddhist uh, which has obviously been the beauty of our country and also been the bane of our country i would say um, we have about 40 gastroenterologists um, scattered Uh, quite evenly around the country, um, they of course have their own different interests, but most of them would do the bread and butter of gastroenterology in their areas because they are quite they are single man stations. Um, we have a lesser number of GI surgeons, but a quite skillful set. We are we obviously fall we are on we obviously depend on them when we are medical management fails. Our health system is totally free, especially in the government sector. We have about ninety percent of the in patient care is provided for our patients uh, the private sector probably uh, shares about 50% of the outpatient burden uh, but generally our uh, health care worker that's there's probably about one or and two doctor uh, two nurses one doctor and two nurses per 1000 patients that's quite a good uh, good ratio that we have uh, compare what is uh, re required from the who the we have our own uh, ib da data uh, data uh, public uh, or these uh, studies done which have been published in uh, in international journals which generally uh, shows that our ibd uh, rates are going up just like all the other areas in this area in this uh, in this region um these are study which was done by the asia pacific crohn's and colitis epidemiology study which showed that our incidence of ibd crohn's uc is comparable to our region india is not here in this study in this uh, particular group but uh, in this at least in this uh, in this table but uh, our our numbers are more or less equivalent to our uh, neighboring countries uh, these are the uh, a table from the ibd enc consortium which was uh, the ibd enc which was uh, published uh, or presented in ddw in 2019 again numbers Uh, probably are uh, not as these probably just two centers in sri lanka but uh, it says that our ibd numbers are increasing uh, we have probably about uh, twice the amount of ulcerative colitis patients as we see as with crohn's disease um crohn's disease generally we see around the age of onset is about 34 years uh, we have less stricturing and penetrating disease uh, about one fifth of our patients have perianal disease male to female ratio is about 1 Uh, about nine percent of our patients have undergone surgery. If you look at the ulcerative colitis uh, uh, group, uh, the age of onset is slightly. Uh, they are older, probably around forties. Uh, we have a lot more left-sided colitis than pancolitis. Uh, male to female to male ratio is one point five. Uh, we our collective rates are definitely much much lower than what's recorded in the Western literature. It's about. Uh, uh, 9% in at 15 years and uh, the colorectal cancer incidence incidence again is quite low as well as the primary sclerosis in cholangitis incidence the cumulative survival rates are generally uh, almost equivalent to the general population even after 15 years the when you look at the management of ibd uh, i think fortunately most of our ibd patients get managed by gastroenterologists uh, probably about 10 15 years they were managed by physicians surgeons and a variety of different uh, doctors but definitely uh, presently i would say that most ibd patients do get managed by the gastroenterologist uh, drugs wise we have access to most drugs available by ibd uh, the five as says we have different of uh, uh, different of uh, different uh, uh, brands or generics uh, suppositories of course are not freely available in sri lanka but it's unregistered and available in a limited number Uh, about 50% of our patients are on esotherapy biologics are less obviously due financial reasons or the need is obvious also less uh, it's about maximum 7% we have quite a free access to infliximab and adalimumab but the rest of drugs are not frequently available and only available on a name patient basis uh, like i said we do call back on our surgical expertise expertise for emergency and elective surgeries 
and they do all the different types of IBD surgery available. Uh, we have our problems, which again are common to probably our region. Biologics available, like I told you, it's due to financial reasons, uh, are limited, restricted, like, like I told you, because everything is supplied free of charge from the health, from the government. So <clears throat> it's not always easy to get the expensive biologics available for patients. Infections, uh, a big problem, uh, uh, TB, uh, especially when we want to give biologics to our patients. Uh, nutrition is uh, a, 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 different, a definite a big problem because especially our cold disease patients come from a, a low income a rural setting and definitely when we manage our patients, so although we manage them optimally, med optimally medically, uh, the nutrition definitely lacks behind. Uh, so that's something which uh, we are trying to improve at the moment in our management of IBD patients. Uh, right, so that's well, a little bit of IBD and general health in Sri Lanka. And I was also told to talk about Sri Lanka a little bit. And these are slides which I always put when I talk about Sri Lanka. Um, so I think all of you all, uh, every country can boast about uh, their different attractions from wildlife to uh, heritage sites to their natural beauties. Uh, but the uniqueness of Sri Lanka is that we can go right across our country from uh, within about four to six hours. So you can, in, the, in your morning, you can be on your beach, in the beach. In the evening, you can go and see some wildlife. And the, in the night, you can go and visit the Candy Perahara. And so you basically can cover lots of attractions within one day and you probably can cover all the country within a few days. So that's probably one uniqueness in our country. Uh, just a little bit of the, I've got a few photos of the different uh, attractions. These are the cultural attractions where you get the uh, the well-preserved uh, ruins of the ancient uh, Sinhala civilization, the temples of different architecture. Then you get the, uh, uh, the, these, the candy perahara with the majestically dressed uh, elephants and the uh, fire dancers. Then you get the rock, uh, the lion rock, which is a, a world heritage site and the Sigre frescoes and these are the traditional masks which are used for different uh, cultural active shows. Uh, if you are a nature loving person also Sri Lanka has all the different types of uh, uh, natural beauty from all the elef elephants which are concentrated in small areas you can basically see all the elephants within one day to different types of birds and if you're lucky enough on your way to one of these areas you even come across a bird uh, come across elephant on the road. Um, we have the different types of birds from flamingos to name it, you've got a lot of birds coming uh, from flying from during the winter time from October to March. Sri Lanka is a bird's paradise because all the birds uh, fly to this area when it's winter in the other parts of the world. So it's definitely an attraction for lots of people, the nature lovers. If you're a sports lover, Sri Lanka has all the sports. But uh, Sri Lanka cricket is obviously the uh, main attraction. As most of you all know, we won the World Cup in 1996. And the cricket match, if you do get to go, it's definitely a big party for young and old. From, so it's definitely a time that really people enjoy. And if you're a water sports lover, we have got the different types of water sports from snorkeling to whitewater rafting. Um, we have banana boat rides, kite surfing, and jet skiing. So all different types of water sports are also available if you do are uh, one of those people who likes sports of course if you're one of those lazy people who like to be in your hotel indulging in all the different types of food sri lanka has all the different um, types of food to tantalize your food taste buds and um, so since we are multicultural and multi-ethnic we have different types of uh, foods food types which you definitely will not see in most other parts of the world um, so that's a little bit of our country and so if you do get to come, hopefully after this, uh, the COVID pandemic, when our airports do open at some time, uh, we welcome you to Sri Lanka. And like we say, it is definitely a paradise like no other. Thank you, Rupa. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilesh, that for that window into uh, Sri Lanka. Welcome you back to yet another episode of uh, uh, IBD ENC or IBD Speaks as we, uh, as we say. And the theme for today's meeting is COVID-19 and IBD, all that you need to know. 
when we talk of covid and ibd there are so many questions that come to our mind uh, and it is we are endeavor to answer or find answers to most of the questions if it is possible there will be some obviously uh, we may not be able to find answers but certainly we'll have time for discussion so we go head straight into the academic part of this session and we have two speakers ahead of us to introduce the first speaker is my great privilege to introduce professor ng siu chien assistant dean development professor department of medicine and therapeutics chinese university of hong kong she is also the associate director center for gut microbiota and research and her experience expertise and interests revolve around of course ibd besides that fecal microbiota transplantation colorectal cancer and endoscopy her research interests also revolve around the same she's got she's a very well decorated uh, professional and the latest of which was uh, as recent as 2020 2019 where she won or she was decorated with the 14th joanna and david sachar md international award and visiting professor professorship in inflammatory bowel diseases at the mount sinai school of medicine that is as late as 2019 and a lot of other um her uh, awards and honors she is also the associate editor of gut and today we have professor siu going to speak to us on a very important topic covid 19 in an ibd patient what is different with this i hand it over to you professor siu for your talk thank you very much dr ramesh for this very kind introduction uh, and i'm humbled and really honored uh, for the invitation and very nice to see all the friends and on zoom at the moment um also to thank uh, rupa of course it's not because of covid i would have loved to be on an elephant with uh, rupa like how the old days we used to be or to enjoy the company after a full days uh, meeting and i think these are reminiscences of old times of how uh, we learn from each other and now we survive and live on zoom and hopefully the pandemic would be over soon but i want to to highlight that within the asia pacific region um there are a lot of key leaders who jumped immediately to basically work on guidelines then ibd um was um, affected during the covid-19 pandemic and they can see here many of these sort of authors for example let like dr uis ida rupa and our friends within the asia pacific region uh, set up together to set some guidelines and some of the um recommendations that i'm going to talk about uh, pertain to some of these uh, work that came out so the real question is as a patient with inflammatory bowel disease when the pandemic hit um many people will ask am i different or is there anything i need to do differently from my spouse from my family from my friends who don't have ibd i think there are four areas i really hope to cover today um the first question which um, patients would like to know is are they at an increased risk of contracting the virus compared to someone without ibd secondly if they do happen to have covid do they suffer more symptoms on top of the fact that they already have symptoms from the disease and importantly do ibd patients with covid-19 have worse outcomes and last but not least certainly something we get called a lot is what should i do with my drugs should i stop should i continue and will it be affected um the outcome with covid-19 so looking at our patients with ibd and increased risk of contracting sars-cov-2 i think we have a lot of evidence now and to summarize uh, when the pandemic hit uh, me and our good friends from taiwan shu chen wei which we both have registries of ibd in hong kong and taiwan we started looking at close to 5000 of our patients in hong kong and taiwan in the population based setting and reassuringly that was in the early pandemic almost a year ago 
though none of the patients with IBD were infected and many patients got tested and none were positive. But certainly we know that subsequently more IBD patients did contract, I mean, the virus. But if you look around other places like in Italy, in fact, they look across and they found 0.6% of patients were diagnosed with COVID-19. And importantly, when they compared with other population, IBD patients seem to have a lower adjusted incidence ratio of COVID-19. And reassuringly, they have similar associated mortality ratio. And now I think if you look across America, Netherlands, and even in Denmark, there are population-based studies showing us IBD patients have similar incidence of having SARS-CoV-2 compared to the general population and they are comparable. In fact, in the subsequent study, they found that they might have a lower prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 than the general population. So what we could conclude for now is based on population-based studies, cohort studies from both the East and the West, having inflammatory bowel disease itself is not regarded as an independent risk factors for acquiring COVID-19. So I think we can probably reassure our patients, although, there's a possible involvement of the GI symptoms and current evidence does not support that, you know, having the disease would cause IBD to flare out. But in patients with IBD, it's not just the disease itself. We know that they are on drugs. We know some may have continuation of active disease with malnutrition. Some patients may be obliged to visit clinics to get their drugs in the medical setting. And patients with IBD, like anybody else, also have underlying health conditions like comorbidities, and some of them are elderly. And these, we now know, are the risk factors for having COVID-19. So in the early pandemic, an Italian study looked at patients with inflammatory bowel disease who happened to got COVID. And what are the things that predict whether they have worse outcome? So as mentioned before, active disease, uncontrolled disease, older age, presence of comorbidities, not surprisingly, cause them to have a higher risk of pneumonia and death in these patients, but not their medical therapy. So that was the initial findings um, that was reported. Now, the second question is, if IDV patients get COVID, do they suffer more symptoms? We now know that the ACE2 receptor is not only seen in the lung, but highly expressed in high abundance in the human gut as well. And uh, when this first published, Herbert Tick and myself started summarizing what we know about COVID-19 and the GI tract. And GI symptoms are actually pretty common in these patients. And the detection of virus in the stool does not always correlate with GI symptoms. Hence, there may be individuals who don't have any GI symptoms yet may carry the virus inside their gut. Now, the shedding of SARS-CoV-2 virus in the gut has been shown in several studies because SARS-CoV-2 RNA could also be found in the tissue, such as the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum in more severe cases, and it was associated with ulcers as well. And an Austrian study here showed that raised fecal cow protecting in COVID-19 patients with diarrhea indicates inflammation. So the story may muddle us because we know patients with IBD get diarrhea. And now we're also seeing that COVID-19 also could lead to active and prolonged activity in the gut, even in the absence of symptoms. And we were able to isolate some of this virus and found that there was some life activity in them. So the, myth, the real issue is with the GI involvement in COVID-19, it makes us as physicians a little bit more difficult to decide whether when the patients have diarrhea, whether it could be just the IBD flare or they may have concomitant COVID-19 as well. Because you see here about 12.5 and some studies show up to 60% of COVID-19 patients could present with diarrhea. And in a more recent systematic review by Lauren Perrin and from France, they look at across 23 studies, over 200,000 patients. And what they found interestingly was IBD patients who have COVID-19, they may have similar symptoms with IBD patients without COVID-19, but they have a higher percentage of diarrhea. But currently, 
the diagnostic therapeutic approach does not differ between these patients. So the implications as physicians for patient care is what one could do is you could test the feces for COVID-19 if these patients come with diarrhea and worry they may have concomitant COVID-19 to differentiate those who just have an IBD reassessation. Now, the third question which concerns a patient with IBD is if they were to get COVID, will they have worse outcome? This is a, a talk, um, a abstract at DDW this year, so that was just a month ago, whereby they review over 78,000 patients across 143 hospitals. And what they found was that the patients with both IBD and COVID-19, they have higher rates of ICU admission, ventilation, and lens of hospitals say, you could see here, the fact that with having IBD and COVID-19 leads to some of these uh, worse um, outcome. So a lot of our patients are taking immunosuppressants drug, and does that really affect the COVID-19 outcome? Many of the drugs that they are taking, we know suppress the immune system, and these are the common ones ranging from steroids, immunomodulator, anti-TNF, anti-IL-23, anti-interleukin, and more recently, the one that's been FDA approved, JAK inhibitor. And a lot of these tend to inhibit the immune response to viral infections. So I want to show you some of the data that was spearheaded by the SECURE group, by Mike Kaperman and um, Eric Brander, Jean-Fred Corambeau and Ron Ungaro. And I represented the Asia to help to sort of um, facilitate some of these work. And I think this registry is clearly very important. A lot of patients who were diagnosed in India, I believe also uh, were entered in here. The first message that came out from this registry was in the first part, they only had 325 patients IBD with COVID-19 from 33 countries. And what they found across all drugs, steroids, but not anti-TNF was associated with adverse outcome if patients with IBD were to get COVID. Now, in these patients, they found some with severe COVID-19, some were hospitalized, and some died. And if you look at the odds ratio, what you could appreciate is that systemic steroids lead to an adjusted odds ratio of 6.9 of having worse outcome, including death, including hospitalization, as well as ICU admission, but not other things such as anti-TNF. Now, this is um, work presented at DGW just um, um, two, two weeks ago. This is a large study cohort from Kaiser, so Pemanagan. So if you know, they have a community-based study across a population within the United States. And they survey close to 40,000 patients with IBD, as well as other immune-mediated disease who happen to be SARS-CoV-2 positive. And they look at the risk of adverse outcome. And lo and behold, similarly findings were reproduced. Patients with risk of adverse outcomes are those who also were taking steroids. So you could see that outpatient steroid use increases the risk of severe COVID-19, whereas the use of small molecules inhibitors, immunomodulators did not lead to that. So we may be able to reassure our patients who are on other immunomodulators that they are not at increased risk of adverse outcome. But if you look at other drugs across this, what was interesting that from the secure registry that we published together with Mike Kaperman's group, that those who are on combination therapy, so they look at 1,400 patients from the national registry and they compare them to those who are on anti-TNF monotherapy, but those who are on combination therapy actually have an increased risk of severe COVID-19. So I'll mention a little bit of recommendation later on what you should do in clinical practice based on these data that you might want to stop some of the drugs if not completely needed. Now, tofacitinib is available in the United States and some patients with COVID-19 with IBD who are taking tofacitinib may be of concern, but they found that there was no difference if you're on tofacitinib in terms of more severe COVID-19 outcome. And lastly, what about vedilizumab? Because some of the patients with IBD may be on vedilizumab. This is also work from the Secure IBD Registry. They look at over 2,000 patients. What they found that the COVID-19 outcomes were similar for vedilizumab users versus non-user. However, if you compare vedilizumab monotherapy to anti-TNF monotherapy, it was associated with a higher rate of hospitalization and severe COVID-19. So there was the race of the question of whether anti-TNF may in fact provide a little protective 
effect. I think this is speculation across all the data have not been proven, but the signal certainly is that those who are on MTTN and modern therapy seems to do a little bit better or they don't do worse compared to those who are on other um, biological drugs. So um, we then published this review article together with David Rubin and Brits Christensen in order to provide some recommendation. So the next few slides then provide you with certain recommendations for patients who are on 5-ASA, continue the drug because there are really no risks of increasing having COVID-19 or worse outcome. So for any patients, we suggest that they definitely don't stop the drug. For steroids, as mentioned earlier, because higher dose increase the risk. So what happens is it should be avoided if possible with rapid tethering, consider bucesna instead of the traditional practicalone. If a patient needs to have a cause of steroid because they have a flare, you can consider bucesna or exclusive entry nutrition. If they have been contact with someone with COVID-19, you might want to taper it quickly if possible in order to not let them have a worse outcome in case they were to contract the virus. Now for immunomodulators, I think the reassuring news is that there's no clear evidence that with the immunosuppressants such as azathioprine, methotrexate, it actually causes an increased risk or worse outcome. And most patients can continue at a stable dose. But we certainly, in the, during the very um, bad pandemic, we may not encourage someone to increase I mean, the dose. But if they were tested positive and they have COVID-19, you might want to temporarily stop it for the patient to recover and then you can reintroduce again. For biologics, as mentioned earlier, you could see anti-TNF appeared to be relatively safe. Mm -hmm. If you're starting a new patient in the early pandemic when they can't get access to drugs in the hospital, in the United States, some people suggest using subcut dosage, although anti-TNF subcut may not be available all around the world. And some people have really switched from infusions to subcut. If combination is required, as you saw from the data from the secure registry, combination therapy was associated with worse outcome. So if not necessary, you might just continue monotherapy. But of course, if you're in contact with someone who has it, or if you have the virus, then really we have to withhold until the patient clears the infection. For JAK inhibitors, I think the story is similar. Use the lowest dose to maintain remission as possible, which is five milligrams twice daily. Avoid to start a drug during the pandemic unless you have no alternatives. And if you are in contact with someone or you tested positive, then consider to be holding. So it's rather consistent. So in order to summarize this, the International Organization of IOIBD had some pictorial recommendation. Do IBD drugs increase the risk? You can see most of it really was no, apart from steroids for now, higher dose steroids. What are should patients discontinue to prevent? You could see pretty much everything was no for all the drugs, apart again for high dose prednisolone. What about should you reduce the dose to prevent the infection? You can see it's actually none for any of these, although it may be uncertain for combination therapy, but for steroids high dose, yes, during the pandemic, you should try to reduce the dose and taper quickly, but not for the rest of the drugs. What about should you stop if you develop COVID-19? Not for 5 ESA. I think for steroids, for azathioprine, methotrexate, anti-TNF, all the rest of the um, biologics and combination, the answer will be straightforward. Yes, until they have cleared the virus, then you can consider restarting. So I think in any patient who have active disease comes to your clinic during the pandemic, you should treat this patient as what you would do when you choose before the COVID-19 era, apart from high dose steroids if possible. So there are now a lot of recommendations which are very consistent. You can see the ACG, the Crohn's and colitis, the ECHO, as well as now the APAG guidelines tell us that actually do not stop if not necessary and only stop if they do have the disease. So lastly, you could see these are some of the specific advice for steroid. Caution use is important. And data actually may suggest increased mortality and secondary infection. So anything higher than 20 milligrams not to continue for too long a period. No, the last few slides is basically on how you manage someone in subgroup. Some patients may fall pregnant and they're worried. Are they at higher risk of having the infection? compared to someone who's non-pregnant. I think pregnancy should be considered a high-risk indicator for COVID-19. And all pregnant women needs to withhold with all the hand hygiene, 
portable and once effective and safe vaccines available, and I'm sure Dr. Ui will speak to you about that, they should actually have it. And if the vaccine has been proven to be safe that they administer during pregnancy, then they should be vaccinated as well. For elderly patients, we know it's a big problem because they are frail and they are at a higher risk. So I would go for monotherapy if possible in these elderly patients and avoid combination therapy. And lastly, um, astigma and bedazap may also be preferred in these high-risk individuals. And pediatric, the young children, of course, right now we don't have a vaccine for them, but children with IBD should follow the same principles as the adults as well. So the general advice, all we need to know, still, even the vaccination, even with not changing the drug, all IBD patients need to be like someone who is not IBD, try not to have essential you know, travel, keep a distance as well as um, gathering still during the active pandemic. So in summary, I think we now know that IBD itself is not an independent, independent risk factors for COVID-19, but increasing age, comorbidities, steroids are with severe COVID-19 outcomes. And reassuringly, the TNF antagonists do not cause severe COVID outcome, but those who are on combination therapy may do a little bit worse. So it's possible moral therapy if they can tolerate that. And all patients still need to have the vaccination if they can and should exercise social distancing. And for patients who are stable, do continue. There's no reason to stop. The last thing you want is to trigger a flare and they end up being in the hospital. But in the very unlikely, unfortunate situation, if they were to develop COVID-19, then you have no choice but to stop the drug, wait for the infection to resolve, and then restart that. And don't forget about certain potential drug interactions. So I like to say, look, this was in AOCC 2017. A lot of our friends uh, were there. It was sort of happy times. And I hope that in the very near future, we can all meet again in person and not through Zoom. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Siu. That was a talk which was loaded with a lot of messages. I think you answered virtually all the questions that we had set out uh, when we planned for this meeting. We will have a Q&A session uh, at the very end. So I request you to please stay back with us for the Q&A session subsequently. We Thank now you. go on to the second uh, talk and the second talk is also probably, is, is equally important. And the speaker is Dr. Ui Chu Jin, who's a gastroenterologist, practicing gastroenterologist at Glenigus Hospital, Singapore. Uh, he has uh, uh, been involved in gastroenterology uh, for quite a long time. He continues, uh, he was formerly the head of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Singapore General Hospital. He continues to be a visiting consultant to the IBD center at this particular hospital. He was a chairman of the gastroenterologist at the Academy of Medicine of Singapore from 2011 to 2015. His research interests, of course, includes, include inflammatory bowel disease, malabsorption, and disorders related to helicobacter pylori bacteria. He has published in various journals, very widely traveled, and also well widely uh, uh, a well-decorated uh, professional. And Dr. Ui Chun Jin will talk to us on vaccination for COVID-19 in IBD patients. It is over to you, Professor Chun, uh, Ui Chun Jin. I think you're fondly called DJ. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Ramesh, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, you've been extremely effusive. Also, thanks to Rupa and the whole organizing committee in this uh, IBD Ant uh, platform. I'm uh, delighted to participate. So, the brief given to me was COVID 19 vaccination in IBD and what is new. Uh, on, th on this note, I do not have any uh, uh, disclosures, uh, competing disclosures. So really, um, these are the current approaches to viral vaccine development. Uh, on the old, uh, on one side, on the right, you, uh, you on, the, on the left, to, uh, it's the life attenuated uh, old and um, traditional models. Uh, we have also quite a bit of the whole inactivated uh, vaccines. Nowadays, we have the very newer technology, which is the RNA technology. Some of the older uh, recombinant technology has been there for a few decades, uh, the recombinant viral vectors and the recombinant bacterial vectors. 
and uh, to, to, to put things in place. Uh, what are the names that are assigned to all this? Uh, the Sinopharm, Sinovac, Barat Biotech are really the full inactivated viral vaccines. The Pfizer, Moderna, and the Actuarius uh, NUS, uh, Duke NUS uh, venture is RNA vaccine. And for J and J, AstraZeneca, uh, AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and CanSino, these are the recombinant viral technologies. So, really, for for a vaccine, we really need to understand what makes it effective. Certainly, uh, there are many host factors that will impact on that. Certainly, age people who are older tend to have a lower efficacy. For some some reason, females may have a higher response rate. We, uh, Dr. Siu alluded to pregnancy and perhaps uh, there could be some impact on vaccine effectiveness and safety. We do know obesity does uh, change the uh, effectiveness of vaccines and so on and so forth. And really certain chronic diseases uh, can certainly do that along with some previous immune history, genetic polymorphism, and interestingly, microbiota. So also we have uh, in, in many of our Page, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, oops. Uh, sorry, I skipped many slides. Uh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Uh, let me take it all the way back. Just for having grubby hands. Okay. So, just talking about, uh, obviously, uh, there may be many reasons for uh, why we subject a patient to immunosuppression. And in IBD patients, obviously, there are a lot of drugs that actually can immunosuppress the patient. And we'll probably talk a little bit about uh, uh, what are the drugs that may have uh, impact on uh, effective development of neutralizing antibodies. But suffice to say, uh, our patients with IBD, uh, really live vaccines should be contraindicated because the, the, there's always a risk of disseminated uh, infection. So looking at, um, you know, we've been hearing that perhaps is it true or not? And based on the survey that uh, Dr. Rupa sent out to the respondees and a lot of, been, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, have answers have alluded to whether anti-TNF might impact uh, the, the effectiveness of vaccine. So the reality is if you look back at some of the old vaccines that are in place and whether we have used anti-TNF, you find that there's no consistent answer. Perhaps in hepatitis A and B vaccine along influenza, there is some impact when you use anti-TNF onto the vaccine's efficacy. But if you use uh, pneumococcal and you use the tetanus or pertussis, you find that actually the vaccine is fully effective. So I think really the, the point to be made is that perhaps it has to be individualized. Uh, we have to study to see whether, uh, um, you know, co co uh, COVID vaccine uh, is effective in our patients with NTTNF. So this is currently what it is out there. These are the, uh, the vaccines that are have been approved in various jurisdictions and various countries. And um, the mRNA ones are essentially Pfizer and Moderna. The non-replicating viral vectors are AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson. And in many countries around the world, Sinovac and Sinopharm are, have also been uh, approved for use. There are many in the pipeline, but they are all not ready for discussion yet at, at this point. So, Whatever the case is, uh, if you look around at the medical societies that uh, look after patients with immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, be it, be it in rheumatology, be it in inflammatory bowel disease or dermatology, all of them consistently tell us that they support SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccination in all our immune-mediated uh, inflammatory bowel in, uh, inflammatory diseases, including IBD, of course. So what we don't know is, um, you know, are there differences in how uh, vaccines uh, are effective in different, uh, like when, when we use the nucleus, nucleic acid-based vaccines versus viral vector vaccines? Well, the reality is that uh, the data is slowly emerging. We are beginning to learn a bit more. 
But uh, at the moment, we have uh, a few observational studies that may guide us to understand this a bit more. So one of the, one of the three studies that I'm going to uh, highlight today in a short time is the first one is a small study, uh, you know, single center uh, uh, German study, basically looking at a variety of immune-related diseases ranging from rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis to IBD. And the vaccines used included uh, essentially the, the two RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. More importantly, in this small cohort of patients, um, all, all of them could uh, mount uh, antibodies to spike protein, meaning the neutralizing antibodies were detected. And interestingly, uh, more importantly, the disease activity remained stable post-vaccination because I think we wanted to know, just like Sue presented, uh, does COVID infection aggravate IBD? We also want to know whether um, the COVID vaccination aggravates the, the disease state. So the short answer, at least in this single study, small number, uh, the answer is that the disease does not get impacted. More importantly also, safety profile is similar to whether uh, to healthy controls. Yeah. So of course, there are, these are small studies, so we really need bigger studies. Two more uh, studies which I would like to quote, and one of them I'm going to go into a bit more detail, is the Clarity Vaccine Sub-Study. Basically, this one shows that uh, at least after one dose of the vaccination, uh, be it the, the Pfizer Biotech or the AstraZeneca one, um, the zero conversion rate was slightly lower in the infliximab uh, arm versus the vedolizumab treated patients. However, a second dose led to zero conversion in most patients. On the other side, there's this another study from America basically looking at uh, zero conversion rates of patients uh, receiving two doses of vaccination at the appropriate interval. And what was uh, uh, fantastic was 100% of those uh, patients developed zero conversion. So this was very reassuring. So I, I want to go a little bit into details of the, vex, uh, the Clarity vaccine sub-study. So basically, this is uh, uh, one that uh, uh, look at... Uh, whether patients with IBD treated in Fliximab have an attenuated serological response to a single dose of the COVID vaccine. So this is a, a nice study to show that uh, the, the green shows actually uh, um, the, the antibody thesis uh, after infliximab, and the orange shows the antibody thesis after vedolizumab. So whether it is uh, you know, uh, Moderna or, or, or Pfizer, you find that the trend is the same. Somehow, for whatever reason, after one dose, the uh, uh, antibodies, at least for the uh, spike um, uh, area, was lower for patients who were treated in Plexmap versus Plexmap. And it didn't matter whether you're using one, whichever uh, RNA uh, vaccine. So when they did a multivariate anal uh, regression analysis, they found that uh, factors that were associated with lower antibody concentration were patients were older, as we expect. And consistently, we keep seeing that patients who are on immunomodulators seems to mount a lower response. Some patients with Crohn's and interestingly, some patients who smoke. Uh, and whereas interestingly, non-white ethnicity was associated with higher antibody concentration. This is a, 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 a look at percentage zero conversion after one dose of vaccination. And you find that in general, patients with vedolizumab had a higher level of uh, antibodies. Patients with vedolizumab and immunomodulators uh, had a smaller, smaller uh, level of uh, zero positivity. This is also replicated in patients in infliximab. So in, pa in patients with infliximab, the levels were already lower than vedolizumab, but if they were on combination therapy immunomodulator, they do worse, or in the sense that they had the lowest seroconversion rate. And this was true whether uh, we were to use Pfizer or Moderna. So interestingly also, if you put a patient and they, uh, on, on one of the two uh, uh, vaccines, and they develop antibodies, you find that the, the antibodies in patients with infliximab tend to drop after three weeks after the first vaccine dose, whereas those with vedolizumab tend to hold on 
And uh, the ones, of course, in orange is vetulizumab. The ones in green is infliximab. And that was quite interesting. However, if you dose the patients with two doses, for example, if you look at this, this cartoon on the left, one dose, uh, uh, if inflicts, uh, one dose on a patient inflicts map, the levels are here. Two doses bring it up here. Similarly, if a patient who has been infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and they get only one more dose of the vaccine, the levels are equivalent to two doses of vaccine. So that's quite interesting. And this is borne out by whether your, if our patient, the patients were on infliximab or vedulizumab. It's quite interesting. So the author's conclusion on the Clarity uh, vaccine sub-study was that infliximab is associated at an attenuated immunogenicity, at least to a single dose. Immunomodulators, for sure, blunts the immunogenicity rates to the, both the vaccines. And vaccination after infection or a second dose of vaccine led to zero conversion in most patients. So that's important to know that I think in our patients who are on uh, NTTNA or even vedulizumab, I think we should tell our patients that except for those who have been infected by COVID, they should really go for two doses of the vaccine as scheduled. And it's also important not only that they go for the second dose of the vaccine, that they receive it at the appropriate time. So if it's Pfizer, it should be three weeks after. If it's Moderna, it should be four weeks after. I understand in many jurisdictions, including the UK, that because of the lack of uh, supply, at least in the initial part, that they've delayed it to six to eight weeks for the second doses. So switching gears to the American study looking at serological responses to the co uh, mRNA COVID vaccines, uh, this is basically to show that uh, these are the patients, all IBD patients, they receive either monotherapy, TNF, or monotherapy vedulizumab plus minus combo therapy, and some with astikanumab. Find that all the patients, whether you look at them through, uh, depending on which antibody you study, total IgG or the IgG-specific uh, uh, receptor binding uh, domain, all the patients who completed two dose vaccines had positive uh, serology, ser seroconversion. And two patients, uh, again, uh, just because they had, uh, they had prior COVID infection, they, received, they, they achieved very high levels uh, after a single vaccine dose, mirroring the Clarity uh, vaccine sub-study. And you find that actually, if you look at this cartoon here, uh, really after uh, within one week, you find that the levels go up. Within two weeks, they do very well. But certainly, uh, it's, it's really a huge difference when they, they are one week after the second vaccine dose. So I think for our IBD patients who are precious, who are already on a lot of biologics, we should really, really uh, emphasize the need for us to keep to the second vaccine and to really get them on time. So these are comparisons of uh, the, the antibodies in uh, patients who have received two COVID vaccines and looking at different medications. So here they see a subtle difference that perhaps, uh, and, and it's different from uh, kind of opposing uh, uh, conclusions that in vedulizumab patients, they saw the theters a bit slightly lower than those with NTTNF as opposed to the CLARITY study. So if we take a step back and look at all this uh, immune activation after vaccination, be it with the, um, you know, the uh, vectors that attenuated or the mRNA vaccines, I think we should remember that all these vaccinations, uh, like we said, we've been paying attention to what has been uh, produced in terms of neutralizing antibodies. But do remember that actually they do also activate cellular immunity so, and this is important because uh, although sometimes in our patients, they have some, uh, like my patients are uh, a little bit, sometimes almost, I would use the word itchy because they will get the vaccination and then they go and, especially those on biologics, and then they'll find that their levels are, yes, they have some levels of neutralizing antibodies, but not too much. And then they start a frenzy to see, to ask whether are they really protected. So I think the answer I tell them is that Yes, it's good to have very high levels of neutralizing antibodies, 
but they are again not absolutely required for immunity against COVID because cellular immunity itself also does play a key role, especially in RNA-derived vaccines. Um, and, and it's interesting because we, we, what we're trying to say is that you, it's, like, it's like hepatitis B vaccination. You know, more than 100, we said you, you're really definitely protected. 10 to, to you know, low, 10, 10 to about 100 sometimes, I think you have, uh, you know, um, the ability to perhaps mount a response when the B virus comes back in. I think because there's an implication also on how cellular immunity will remember, will wake up. So I think the, the analogy, and I've spoken to a lot of vaccine virologists, and they think that perhaps uh, I mean, we shouldn't sweat too much about if the neutralizing antibodies are not too high, as long that they are present, because we think that uh, they think that the cellular immunity will kick in if the patient uh, gets exposed to the COVID virus. So, okay, uh, I'm going to finish by talking about timing. Really, we look at the IOIBD and the American College of Rheumatology. Basically, uh, the, 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 the recommendations are very consistent. When is the best time to vaccinate IBD patients? The answer should be at the earliest opportunity. You should not defer the, the vaccination just because uh, the patient is starting to receive the immune-modifying therapies. Really, most... Uh, Professional organizations will say IBD disease activity should not impact timing, although a few will say perhaps it's best to do it when they are quiescent. But I think uh, sometimes when the disease is florid and you need to hit the patient very hard, I think any time is a good time for the patient to get vaccination. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about also that uh, really you could administer the vaccination anytime, whether it's induction or maintenance therapy. And I think we should uh, always emphasize that to the patient that they shouldn't uh, get too frazzled. Okay, so I'm going to just finish off with a few key takeaways. I think uh, the risk of uh, COVID vaccination in IBD patients are very low. So any patient uh, uh, who's receiving biologics, immunomodulator or steroids, the effectiveness is known to be attenuated, but certainly not abolished. So we think that even partial protection will be of benefit because especially now we are judging protection by neutralizing body uh, antibodies, looking at just the humoral aspect of this immunity. Don't forget there's another aspect of cellular immunity. I think uh, there's no difference between the current approved uh, vaccines out there. I think we should just accept whichever vaccine that's made available in your jurisdiction. Uh, the only caveat will say that life attenuated vaccines at the moment should remain contraindicated. And certainly uh, whatever uh, you know, regime that uh, the, 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 the original uh, vaccine uh, comes with its recommendation should be strictly enforced in our IBD patients especially those on immunomodulators. So in short, again, to emphasize, and I can't say it more, uh, that the IBD patients should be vaccinated at the earliest opportunity. I, IBD patients will call me every week to ask me when it, should they get vaccinated. The standard answer from my nurses, my uh, nurse clinician to them will be, the moment you get it, the moment you have an appointment, just go. And in Singapore now, if you're 60 years old and, and above, you could just walk into a vaccination center, register and get your vaccination on the spot. So of course, we did say that perhaps when the disease is quiet, maybe that's a better time. But really, I, I don't believe that uh, you know it should be uh, uh, deferred. So patients who have previously contracted and recovered from COVID should also receive uh, vaccination, uh, the, from the, at least from the CLARITY study and the CARES study we are wondering whether just one dose is sufficient, but in, if you're in doubt, please go for two. And I think at the end of the day, I want to emphasize what Sue has mentioned, that yes, you get vaccinated, you should still adhere to protective measures, hand hygiene, mask, etc. Because the other, take, the other takeaway that I didn't put in is that vaccination does not prevent you from getting infected. But if you get infected, number one, you're likely, more likely than not, that your uh, infection is uh, asymptomatic, number one. Number two, your risk of ending up in ICU is so, so much low to the tune of 80 to 90 percent uh, improvement, or as opposed to those who are not vaccinated. And perhaps now they are also talking that perhaps uh, this, at least for the RNA vaccines, there's even protection for 
all the very difficult variants that are emerging, like the deltas. So the fun fact before I finish is that uh, a lot of my patients tell me, oh, you know, after that, after the vaccination, my arm was tired, I couldn't move, I got fevers and all that. And they were so excited saying that maybe if there was a lot of side effects from a vaccine, maybe the, the vaccine's working a bit better. So the, the, the reality is I hate to, to uh, bust their, their bubble, but at least from this study, from the uh, yellow fever study, that um, systemic AEs are not associated with vaccine viremia and does not impact immunogenicity. So that's what you might have to tell your patients. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wu. To Jin, I think uh, uh, it was a crystal clear presentation. Uh, and I think the message which has come across is advise patients, whichever phase of act, uh, activity they are in, get the vaccine, whatever vaccine comes your way, take it and ensure that you take the second dose also. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, uh, a request to all the delegates, please keep the questions coming in. We have uh, time for question answer at the end of this panel discussion that is to follow. Uh, we go on to the third part of uh, today's, uh, today's program, and this is uh, a panel discussion on clinical scenarios in the IBD COVID world to be moderated by Professor Ida Hilmi. Ida Hilmi has been an integral part of IBD ENC ever since its inception, and she's been uh, one of the forces behind uh, establishing IBD ENC as a, uh, a major academic platform for inflammatory bowel disease. She's a professor and consultant in gastroenterology, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Graduated with honors from the University of Glasgow in 1997. She went on to do her training in internal medicine in Oxford and obtained her membership of the Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom in 2000. She then joined the Northeast London Gastroenterology training program before returning to Malaysia in 2000. She is currently the head of the Division of Gastroenterology and Director of Endoscopy at the University of Malaya Medical Center, as well as the Chairman of the Malaysian Inflammatory Bowel Disease Special Interest Group. Professor Hilmi's uh, areas of interest include IBD, EUS, and colorectal cancer screening. And today she'll be moderating the session on clinical scenarios in the IBD COVID world. It is over to you, Professor Ida Hilmi to first introduce your panelists and take the panel discussion ahead. Over to you, Professor Ida. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for that very kind introduction. Um, so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists um, who will be discussing some cases of uh, uh, that, that I actually have in my center, uh, which really sort of, if you like, um, uh, put all these uh, fantastic talks uh, that were given by Sue and uh, CJ into the real world, if you like. So my panelists, uh, I would give me pleasure to introduce Professor Mahmoud Omar, who is the head of internal uh, medicine department, consultant tropical medicine of digestive diseases and endoscopy in Kuwait, as well as professor of gastroenterology and hepatology in Theodore Bilhart's Research Institute of Egypt. The next uh, panelist is Professor Usha Dutta, who is an Associate Professor of Gastroenterology in the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, India. And Dr. Malati Satya Karan, who works at the MGM Healthcare in Chennai and Rainbow Children's Hospital in Chennai. So um, I will start without any further ado. And uh, I, we will also welcome some uh, opinions from uh, Sue, Rupa, and CJ as well. Sorry. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we do. can. Oh. Okay. Okay, so um, so the first case uh, is a 42-year-old man who's a pharmacist, and he has the severe Crohn's disease of the proximal ileum with multiple laparotomies. He developed an enterocutaneous fistula proximal to the anastomotic site in 2016, 
And initially it started off as just a small thing, but then it just got bigger and bigger. Um, and um, half-heartedly, uh, I tried him on a bit of infliximab, but unfortunately he um, had an infusion reaction because he actually had infliximab back in 2013. So after the long drug holiday, uh, he developed an infusion reaction. For some reimbursement issues, he was not keen on adalumumab. Uh, he was also not keen on surgery at that time because he'd had multiple laparotomies. The surgeons were also not keen. He was on azathioprine, but finally, because really the entrocutaneous fistula got bigger and bigger, he finally agreed for surgery. And uh, again, this is real life. He was planned for surgery. Then COVID came along and we already have a waiting list in our you know, public hospital for surgery, for non-cancer uh, surgery. Um, and then uh, it just got delayed and delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in January, 2021, he was admitted to hospital because he got he had increased output from the entrocutaneous fistula. He had lost quite a lot of weight and this time he had a fever as well. He never had fever before actually, uh, despite the ECF. At that time, uh, the swab for um, SARS-CoV was negative. Uh, he had a CT scan which showed active disease in um, uh, an active ECF um, and active Crohn's disease, but there was no obvious collection. He was started on a bit of uh, IV antibiotics, but unfortunately at that time, um, he was in a ward where there was an outbreak of COVID. So um, there was a house officer, again, in India, you probably see this a lot, uh, who actually had um, infected, um, I think, at least eight to 10 people in the ward with COVID. And um, yeah, so as after he, got, he had discharged, after he was discharged, he then developed typical symptoms of COVID, but no shortness of breath. Um, and now uh, his, he was positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I think Sue had brought up all the questions before. Um, you know, these are the questions that people will ask over and over again. Um, you know, are they more susceptible to COVID? Are they more likely to have severe illness? What are you gonna do about azathioprine? When you stopped it, are you gonna start it again? When? Um, and uh, what if you were on biologics? What if you had been on adalumumab, for example? Would you have carried that on? And um, again, so talking about which type of biologic, would it matter as well? So could you have carried on if you was on ustekinumab, for example, with um, relatively good safety data? Uh, but if it was on adalumumab, would you stop it? So these are some of the things I think that you'd have to think about in a real life scenario. So maybe I would open it up to the panelists and to see what they say. Dr. Malati? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Ida, for that uh, wonderful case and good you brought a real life series here. This is what you have when you face the individual. We may know, we may have knowledge, we may have, we know the theory, but then when the individual comes, we get caught. And Sue has uh, covered most of the things. So like she said, now what to do with this patient? So this patient has both uh, a severe IBD and also a symptomatic COVID. So I think that is very, very important. It's just not positive for COVID, but symptomatic. So at present, we just have to do, you know, treat the COVID for some time. Whatever is the management protocols has to be done. And we have to hold on to this IBD for a period, like she has said, at least for some time till the symptoms decrease. And majority, most of the societies feel that either you wait for the RT-PCR to be negative or 14 days or asymptomatic. You know, the protocol changes, but more or less it becomes the same because 14 days. So it's more than 10 days you have to wait. But during the time, I think individualized treatment is also very, very important. And like you said, now he's already sensitive to biologicals. We've come to one point where we don't have anything more. So by this time, I think you should have a board meeting and find out what are we going to do with him? What are we going to do? What do we have in our hand to do for him? Yes, we will treat the COVID. But once you finish the COVID, he's going to ask you, what will you do for me? Am I going for surgery? And you said so much. So I think like you've given a hint, I will go to the next biologic. 
I'll take that. And that may be an answer which I will think, you know, we have to weigh both and individualize and tailor the treatment. And it's just not uh, asymptomatic COVID, it's a symptomatic COVID. So we have to admit him first because he's gone home. Bring him back to the hospital, readmit him, watch him, how he's going in the COVID and watch this also. Anyone has any comments? Um, yeah. Anyone feel free to answer Dr. Ramesh, Rupa? Uh, but what about, uh, um, Mahmoud? what about Mahmoud and uh, Malati? Any comments? I, I agree on readmitting the patient, bringing him back to the hospital. And uh, after uh, two weeks, when the COVID symptoms is, uh, are released, uh, or he tested negative, uh, PCR is negative, I think we should consider surgery and then we will see about the next biologicals. I think Usha? Yeah, the comment I have here is I think Sue's lecture was very clear on all these components. So in the real life scenario, I would like to stop as a therapist, admit the patient, the CRP, D-dimers and all those values so that I know the degree of activity of the COVID disease so that I can classify him for the COVID infection and watch him for any respiratory issues, uh, do a six minute walk test, see how stable he is on that. So once the COVID subsides and he becomes RT-PCR negative, I would like to restart him on azathioprine and plan the final therapy with him with biologics. And uh, I would avoid steroids as far as possible. And if I have to give steroids, I will give oral budesonide. I think okay. Sue. Uh, I agree with every single what Dr. Duta just said. <laughs> every single of it. I think she basically just summarized think, um, the first two. I, I, I think it, it is what Sue is saying that once it is symptomatic COVID. I think COVID takes upper hand and um, uh, we should, I mean, because IBD we can manage, we should avoid steroids unless it is needed for the COVID per se. Uh, admit the patient, focus on the COVID, just keep the IBD stable. And uh, I think that is how it should be. You have to balance constantly between, perhaps between IBD and COVID and whichever is stronger, focus more on that. Yes. And I think question. you recover from, from the um, COVID. I think the key thing is the next step, actually, trying to plan for the um, surgery, if that's really what um, the, the patient needs, and to have an environment. Because usually with that situation, the problem is the surgical theatre is shut down and everything because of the COVID, and you... Sorry, Dr. Omar. Yes, you're saying... In, in case uh, the patient is not allergic to uh, anti-TNF, I mean to infliximab, in another patient, I mean, uh, can we keep uh, this infliximab that may be effective also for COVID? That's a um, very interesting question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I. I think if you look at what the, um, I guess Dr. Omar, I mean, your point is absolutely because the question is could um, NTTNF have, I think maybe we haven't got any data to show it works for COVID or it's effective as a drug, but I think the epidemiology data we shown is that those who are on it, there may be a little element of protection compared to other non-NTTNF um, drugs. But the current recommendations uh, is still that if they were to have symptomatic COVID and are on NTTNF, then to um, stop it. But you're right. I mean, if they recover from it, then I think there's every reason that if that's the right drug for the patient, it's okay to, to start or use. Uh, I was just, can I ask something? And I was just wondering, Sue, whether budesonide uh, is better than systemic uh, steroids because uh, actually Usha has given that uh, as uh, we can start budesonide instead of uh, steroids. Do you think it is safer? Because I think the Japanese group say it's not. 
Um, yes, I think um, at the moment the guidelines recommend uh, if you were to use a steroid, you have to choose one, then uh, budesonide was the preferred one over um, um, the traditional prednisolone. I think it's okay to use prednisolone. I have to say I have actually used because there are some patients who do not respond to budesonide, unfortunately, even you know when they have a massive active flare. So I normally, if needed, I use it for a short period of time. So even within a COVID pandemic, I do have to use 30 or above so the 20 milligrams, but I only give 30 for a couple of days. Once I see the response, I get it to 20 very quickly. I think once you have that strategy, it's probably um, okay. But the guidelines suggest that if both works equally for that patient, then um, budesonide is preferred over um, systemic steroid. Uh, there's some data from the uh, secure registry to show that the ones on budesonide don't have worse outcome, but those who are taking prednisolone have a slightly worse outcome. So that are the sort of data we have up to now. Thank uh, you. I have okay. a question. I have a question. And uh, the question is about how long will you wait before you start treatment, uh, a non-steroid immunosuppressive treatment for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, given the fact that this patient may be having moderate to severely active disease. Do you wait for 14 days? Because we know that uh, the complications of uh, COVID infection, COVID uh, usually occur going into the second week and these complications are all immune mediate. So would not day seven or eight be the best day to put this patient on non-steroid immunosuppression, which will act both ways against uh, prevent uh, in, uh, problems due to COVID and also uh, act on the primitive bowel syndrome. Yeah, so I think I think that's the whole point, isn't it? That we we don't actually have data for all this, um, and even when to restart any therapy, uh, there's a lot of controversy. So I think I'm in the interest of time. I'm just going to move to some of the slides. Um, sorry. So I think we're not going to go through this because uh, Sue uh, had gone through this at length, really about um, you know the the, the risk of corticosteroids. Um, and uh, again, biologics. So I think we, these has all been, you know, beautifully presented uh, by Sue. But uh, the question is, what should an IBD patient do if they're infected? And I think uh, the recommendation is still to withhold therapy, uh, including uh, the thiopurines, methotrexate, and so on, and delay the dosing of monoclonal antibodies. Sorry, that's for asymptomatic patients. Uh, but he was a symptomatic patient. So um, again, the recommendation is still to delay. And the question is, when do you resume? Uh, as you asked, um, is, well, we don't know. Uh, so for AGA, they actually asked for repeated testing for clearance of virus. I don't think anybody does that anymore. CJ, do you know anything? I, I think that was something perhaps that was done before. I don't know. Uh, but I think the IOIBD expert panel was more like a symptom-based uh, here, I would like to say that no longer we test for patients to become negative because we know somewhere between day 14 and 20, they would all become negative. And even if they are not negative, they are not infected. So given this kind of a scenario, uh, there is no recommendation for testing. Yeah. Uh I agree. I, I tend to agree that because even if you test sometimes beyond day 14, uh, uh, if there are no symptoms, and even if it's positive, it's just uh, viral fragments being shattered and it doesn't connote uh, uh, active COVID infection. Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, uh, I so uh, that's some of the AGA practice guidelines. Again, I think we've already uh, spoken to that at length. So just to tell you what happened to my patient before we move on to the next case, um, so he was treated as uh, CAT2, uh, but with comorbidities, of course. He was admitted for another few days. He actually was fine. He didn't really have any problems at all. No evidence of pneumonia on chest X-ray, no shortness of breath. He withheld his azathioprine, and because he couldn't wait any longer, he managed to get some um, insurance to go for surgery in a private hospital in March. Um, he actually did pretty well after that, and he received his COVID vaccine in May. So, so far, so good. Okay, so let's go on to the second case. 
which is a 75 year old man. I think I consulted CJ for this. Uh, um, so uh, he, he'll know about it. So you can see he's a man with multiple comorbidities and that is his list of medication. So he initially presented to um, my colleague, uh, Professor K.L. Go in March uh, 2021 with uh, PR bleeding. He didn't actually have diarrhea at the time. And he had a very strange um, colonoscopy findings. He had quite severe colitis. Uh, on the left side, he had like a skip lesion in the transverse colon and what I can only describe as, I guess, an extensive cecal patch. It almost extended up to the ascending colon. Uh, his histology was really quite consistent with um, uh, ulcerative colitis, um, and he was started on mesalazine, but uh, his symptoms got worse paradoxically, and he was referred to me. Prof Go said, he's all yours. You can take care of him now. So uh, when I saw him, he, prob he fit the criteria for acute severe ulcerative colitis. He had uh, diarrhea 10 times a day. He actually had one, um, he was pyrexial on admission, but um, you know, uh, that, that settled actually fairly quickly on antibiotics. And uh, these are his blood tests, low HB, uh, CRP of 144. So uh, we actually, I actually did a quick uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy to look for C, uh, CMV. He didn't have any, he also didn't have C. diff. So, um, Sorry. So the question is, uh, what would uh, you do for him, really? I guess that's the question. Anyone? I think he has active disease. Uh, can I come in? Yeah. Sorry, I, I wanted to uh, put the question up. Apologize for this. I think my thing went a little bit wrong. So I think I wanted to ask about what people would do uh, in this setting, you know, uh, because this is a man who is a frail, elderly man, multiple comorbidities, He's got acute severe ulcerative colitis. Um, yeah. So what would you do for him? I think here, like, yeah. uh, I think Mushal wants to say, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rupa was telling us we just have to, you know. Uh, right now, one of the short Can I say? Can I talk? Yeah. Uh, balance between which is now the yeah, go ahead. and here the uh, ulcerative colitis seems to be the one which we have to get. So even if we say we should not give here, I think I will give quickly uh, IV methylprednisolone for a short time and try to you know uh, bring it down first. The the intensity of the disease, the severity, because we have to do something for that frail gentleman. Why and not I biologics? I mean, I am just uh, trying to make the discussion more lively, perhaps, because um, uh, biologics uh, are shown to be better rather than steroids for the COVID scenario. He is definitely acute severe ulcerative colitis. I think I'd ask for comments from CJ, uh, Professor Omar. But even uh, I think non-COVID times, uh, comparing these two for the induction, steroids have always been better than biologicals. I don't. I think we'll wait for the answers. I agree. Uh, both are uh, options. Uh, steroid and biologics are options. But I start with steroid just for do quick uh, uh, remission. He's a frail. He's a high risk of COVID. Uh, uh, I think you should. Uh, we should induct, induce remission as early as possible, quickly with a steroid, and then we may shift to uh, biologics later. And keep in mind that he should be uh, in a kind of uh, isolation to avoid uh, catching the COVID. Or, or... Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, I, I, although in the old days where you were limited by the types of biologics, that would be a plausible way to go. But biologics today are a bit different. You have a variety of biologics, some with excellent safety profile. It means you're not talking about the NTTNFs, you're talking about the non-NTTNF biologics. And um, there are two, of course, the vedolizumab and uh, astikinumab. Vedolizumab would not work for him because it takes too long. 
but now you have uh, IV astigmatic. So I think uh, given the long list of comorbidities, how elderly, how frail, and so on and so forth, I think uh, I, I, depending on the availability of that medication or the types of biologics that are available in the country, you might want to think about IV astigmatic. That's uh, my two cents. Given the Indian scenario, we would treat him with a short course of IV methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone uh, for five days and see his response. I would like to cover him with IV antibiotics and I would watch closely for toxic megacolon. And uh, we don't have the option of IV used to give me in India right now. So as a result, I would not try that. I agree. Theoretically, that is a good alternate. Okay, uh, Dr. Ramesh, Sue, anyone? No, any other suggestions before we move on? I think, Sue, uh, there were some early studies which said that perhaps biologics are safer than steroids in the world of COVID. So, uh, standard treatment, yes, we would go, go for IV steroids. What do you think, Sue? I mean, is there still any substantiation on that? that for a frail patient likely to develop COVID hospital scenario? Uh, um, I, I think uh, it depends on the indication. I think this scenario is acute severe ulcer colitis. And um, as early on, I, I mentioned um, for any patients with very sick disease, I think you should use the medical therapy that uh, just like how you would do it the pre-COVID era actually that gives you the best chance of success and him. Uh, if you look at the data for acute severe ulcer colitis as first line, we know that you know, 70 to 80% will respond and they respond very quickly. So, I mean, in, in, this, in this case, uh, for me, I, I would still actually go for the best um, choice. Uh, he doesn't have COVID, right, um, either. either. He's COVID free at the moment, right? I, I sorry, I missed that part. So if he hasn't, then I would just treat him like any patient before the COVID era. And the reason is because I want to have a second line because we know that when we see rescue therapy, all the data we have now, rescue therapy is with cyclosporin and it flicks him up. So I would go bang with IV steroids for three days. If by three days, I will even be short that three to four days. If it doesn't work, then I'll switch to um, inflix him up in, in this case. Uh, we, we don't have a stick in the map, but certainly something consider if, if we do have it but in Hong Kong that's probably what I, I would do yeah. yeah okay so um so actually I wanted to bring um this study I, I looking through the literature um I don't know if um, you're aware of this uh, but that was published in Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology uh, just recently where they actually looked at acute severe ulcerative colitis during the COVID-19 pandemic so this is pretty interesting because actually they compared uh, about 300 in each group, the COVID pandemic uh, period cohort and the historical control cohort. And this is what they found. They actually didn't find that, that the doctors changed their therapy in any way. So you can see at the top, uh, those who received intravenous steroids before and after were actually the same. Uh, they actually didn't really see any difference in outcomes, including length of stay, ICU admissions uh, and death a slight increased trend towards rescue therapy uh, in the COVID era group. Um, but what they also found interestingly, despite the fact that these patients of course were on high dose of steroids uh, with or without biologic small molecules uh, up during the acute episode up to 90 days, they really didn't see any difference uh, in the uh, incidence of COVID as well. And I think that's very interesting data. It also probably, suggest that perhaps in the short term, you know, if you need to use it, you probably can use IV steroids. And answer to your question, Rupa, the reason why infliximab would not have been a good option in him is because he was diagnosed to have um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction sort of thing. Um, you know, so he, he just had these multiple comorbidities. So it just made me very, very nervous. Of course, the downside of starting steroids was that it did make his uh, diabetes worse as well. So, um, so what did I do for him? 
Well, I did pretty much what I would do uh, in the pre-COVID era. I started him on a bit of antibiotics because of the fever, uh, some IV hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams, QID. I gave him some subcarbonoxaparin. I referred him to the surgeons. Professor April, my colorectal surgeon, said, are you kidding me? Please, I do not want to operate on this patient sort of thing. Uh, but uh, And he had a, quite a stormy course. I mean, he really made me very, very nervous. His CRP was 144. It kind of went up and down. Uh, this was despite uh, about five days of IV steroids. So I call up CJ and I said, what should I do? Um, I was this close to giving him IV infliximab, even though I was very nervous about it. But um, uh, he said, why not try ustekinumab? At that point, I had never used ustekinumab. Uh, for a patient with ulcerative colitis before. So I did something that uh, has never been done. Uh, I actually, first of all, I gave him over his uh, weight-based regime, uh, 390 milligrams. I considered it a high loading dose, if you like, because he only weighed, I think, about 50 kilos or so, maybe even less. And then uh, I gave him another dose at week two. So actually, there are very few case reports uh, of giving actually ustekinumab uh, two weekly. Uh, there was just a smattering, but I said, okay, fine, I'll do it anyway. And then I gave him another one at week six. I also gave him some prednisolone, uh, but uh, uh, this has been tapered off. And it, it took a while, uh, but he's actually much better. His CRP is now 19. Uh, he doesn't have rectal bleeding anymore, but he still has a bit of diarrhea about two to three times a day. And uh, the question now comes, is the COVID, COVID vaccine, you know, when he was on high dose of steroids, I just didn't feel there was any point in giving him the COVID vaccine. He just wasn't well enough. But finally, uh, at about 15 milligrams, he's much better. I, I bit the bullet and I said, let's, let's, let's take the COVID vaccine. And he's done that and he's doing well. So, okay, so I'll just end there, uh, but I hope that the two cases, sort of, as I said before, uh, bring to life some of these issues that we deal every day with our IBD patients in the COVID era. Thank you very much to our I panelists. Think, I think, Ida, you've done a wonderful job. And what has happened is there is a deluge of questions now on just coming in on COVID-19 and biologics and whether it can be used or not. And I think I'll just start off with uh, a few. So um, Dr. G. Kiran Kumar has asked, tocilizumab, which has been used for COVID, uh, and this is for Dr. Sue, uh, is it also effective for IBD? Can you repeat that again? So I missed the first part. Oh, the one that used for yeah. COVID. Uh, yes, yes. So, tocilizumab, italizumab, ah, can yes. it be um, used for IBD? We, we, we haven't had any um, um, clinical data actually on that. So, I think for these some of these small molecules that has been um, trialed to work in COVID-19 that works, uh, I don't think we have any supporting data whether they, they work in IBD at, at the moment. There is another question for you, Sue. This is from Dr. Nitin Jagtap. Uh, he is a consultant at AIG as well. Uh, he says that, is there any difference in patients with IBD and COVID versus other immunological illness and COVID? Yep, so, so that's, that's interesting. Yes, so, so the question is whether um, our IBD patients who are immunosuppressed are they similar to other, um, there, there are a lot, of, apart from the secure registry that focus on um, IBD, there are also secure like registry that focus on other immune mediated disease like the uh, rheumatologists. And I think um, so far, it seems to show that they are actually relatively um, um, similar in terms of um, outcome. The only caveat is that uh, some of the other immune mediated disease are also Older, some of the patients, so they may be biased towards more comorbidity and higher um, poor outcome if you get that. So for our IBD patients, because they are younger, it seems to be an advantage if they do get COVID because we know age is an independent factor for worse prognosis. But apart from that, all the drugs are similar. For all the other immune-mediate disease steroids, this is a bad, I mean, higher dose of steroids. But for all the other small molecules and biologics, uh, really no, no difference and no increased risk. Uh, uh, Dr. Jayanti, you have a, a, a couple of questions, I understand. Uh, 
my question was post covid when will you recommend vaccination for these patients after they recover a uh, cj i think you can Dr. take cj this. cj could pick it up uh say that again i i heard when, when did you recommend a vaccination for patients who have recovered from covid infection uh, well, at least in the setting of IBD, and especially if they are on biologics, the data has shown that uh, uh, if they've had a prior COVID infection, even one dose is extremely uh, useful to take their antibody, neutralizing antibodies right up sky high. So I think uh, we should still recommend that as for sure. But when CJ, I think it, do they do do they recommend because in Ministry of Health here they actually recommend that you have to wait three months or something. Is that what it's like in Singapore as well? Uh, I think there's no data. Is this a, the recommendation is probably based on uh, a guide, uh, uh, expert opinion? I think uh, as soon as you get the vaccine, I think you should just 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 get a jab. Uh, I think because CDC has a recommendation here. CDC says that once you're out of quarantine, after your acute infection, you should be ready to take a vaccination. Some places like in India, the government has recommended after three months, more because of the fact that, you know, there is vaccine shortage. So you want to, you know, these are the people who are already protected. So they can, you can hold on for a little longer but any time after 14 days after the onset of infection, they are ready to take a vaccination. And the other point here is that the natural infection has better antibody response than vaccination. And But anybody who has had a natural infection should still undergo vaccination. So that is the other point. Only if you have had a natural infection and you have received convalescent plasma, you should wait for three months. So apart from this, as early as possible after recovery, after the COVID, you should go in for vaccination. I agree with that. Uh, as soon as it's made available to you, depending on whichever country and yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, our Ministry of Health, yeah, is still insisting on three months. That's no, yeah, three yeah, months, I, I think it's valid, like Dr. Usha has said, because it's based on uh, what's available in the country, they are prioritizing. And uh, I think uh, usually if someone who is recovered from COVID is unlikely to get COVID again, at least not so soon. Uh, we have seen it in the, our dormitory workers that the people who have recovered from COVID, X number of months down the road, they have been reinfected. Uh, so there are questions coming in for you again uh, because of the case. Can an active player take the vaccine? Uh, same question in many forms for CJ as well. Um, if active I, I, and vaccine, IOIBD says you get it anytime as long that the vaccine's in front of you, take it. Uh, some 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 uh, bodies, like for example the dermatologist and all, they will say maybe you could wait. Ideally, uh, if you have the ability to wait that for when the disease is quiet. But my take is uh, anytime that the the vaccine's made available, because vaccine is still a very precious resource in many countries and jurisdictions. Um, if it's there, take it because you never know when you're going to get uh, called again for your next shot. Uh, a question to uh, Ida. Um, what is the future of FMT as a therapeutic strategy in IBD in the post-COVID era? Do you think FMT, fecal microbiota uh, transplant? I think you better ask you this <laughs> because I, 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 I don't. I don't know much about Okay, so you, you could you could take yeah, take up this question. Sorry about yeah. So so I think um two things. Uh, I think your question was in the post-COVID era, but I just want to say in the COVID era, remember a lot of FMT had to be stored because the SARS-CoV-2 virus is found in the gut. So when you screen donor, this is the extra step. You have to be careful because a lot of donors could be asymptomatic and carries the SARS-CoV-2 in their gut, in the stool. So we retest them now. So it increased the cost. Now, the role of it in the post-COVID um, era, assuming you have a very safe screening, is, I mean, I think at the moment, I mean, I mean, for ulcer colitis, we have four randomized controlled trials to show that the remission is about 30%. Um, it's not FDA approved like recurrent C. diff infection. It hasn't gone through that whole process yet. But I think in due course, I believe that it actually may sort of um, become one of the um, paths for patients who are refractory to certain um, drugs like biologics. So the success rate is quite similar to what we see with the um, biologics. It's about 
20% remission at one year, but you need multiple courses of um, FMT, I think, for now. For Crohn's disease, we only have observational study, and there are now randomized controlled trial ongoing. So hopefully, we'll have some of the information next year. Okay. Uh, there's another question on to uh, as to the GI manifestations in wave one versus wave two. We know that wave two, there are a lot of variants involved. Uh, uh, is there any evidence to suggest that the GI manifestations were higher in wave two? I don't know. In India, I'm finding that in the wave two, uh, I'm seeing more patients with just isolated GI symptoms compared to what we saw. And uh, more in the form of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. These are the three common symptoms I'm seeing. Uh, but definitely more the, in wave two than wave one. Uh, uh, could, yeah, anyone else? No, I was just going to ask Dr. Usha. Uh, sorry, because we are not familiar with the wave one, wave two in India. Is the wave two more the, the Delta 16, 17 variant? Exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah, the wave two has more of the Delta uh, the That's variant right. right now. So that may be having a different manifestation than the first wave. I think uh, I would like to say a few words here, and this is particularly for the um, audience. Uh, at AIG, we now have more than 94 patients of IBD with COVID, and that is uh, till today. Interestingly, we have 11 patients who presented just like a flare, with only diarrhea, no fever, uh, and uh, when we want severe diarrhea, but ulcerative colitis patients also diarrhea without blood. So this was quite distinct. I mean, severe diarrhea, 15, 20 motions per day, dehydrated, but no blood. So there were 11 of these patients. At admission, we find them to be COVID positive. And then they later on, two or three of them developed a loss of smell and other things. Uh, I think one or two, we gave remdesivir. And then they responded in one week to 10 days with just antibiotics we gave, no steroids, they responded. The other important thing was we have three patients, the last one who came day before yesterday, of Crohn's disease patients presenting with perforation. So the first case came in the last wave and we thought it was an incidental small bowel Crohn's disease with perforation, managed conservatively, did well. Yesterday, it was a girl who was COVID positive two weeks back, recovered. She was absolutely doing well for the last four years till after COVID and then came with perforation. Too early to say what caused what, but I think amongst the side effects, these were the two important things out of 94 patients that we saw. Um, like uh, the, the colitis presenting only with watery diarrhea and uh, this um, three cases with uh, perforation. Okay, I think that was interesting. Yeah, Omar. Patients like this, do you do a PCR uh, at first uh, visit or you start by uh, stool analysis, fecal care protecting? What is happening is whenever the patient is sick, it is for admission. And so for pre-admission, uh, uh, mandatory testing is done. So for 94, many of them just came with mild symptoms of COVID, cough and cold and other things. And that overall spectrum was not different from what we see in all other patients. So that spectrum, the HRCT scores, the other things were not different. But these were the cases which uh, had presented little differently. They just presented, 11 patients just presented with like a flare. And the COVID was done because uh, for admission purpose. And uh, the other three, as I said, the first uh, one, we just thought it is just an incidental finding, but we have three. And uh, we have one patient post-vaccination for COVID with thromboembolism. Now, these are things, it's too early to comment based on three case or one case, but this is just to say that uh, we have to be a little careful maybe for active Crohn's disease. I think uh, what you were add the sites of perforation, Rupa? 
what were the sites of perforation ulcerative colitis uh, or two were small bowel and yesterday's the young girl uh, she had at the ileocecal region all dissection and astomosis has been done uh, and um, she's okay today they were all crohn's or you uh, all three are crohn's uh, the third one i know more details because she's admitted right now with us uh, she was on biologics and doing very well, stable, absolutely. Uh, the perforation happened um, one week after her COVID test came negative. So this not is not mucormycosis. Question, uh, question to uh, Professor Siu. Uh, uh, this is uh, particularly relevant to differentiating a flare with uh, versus uh, COVID. Uh, do you routinely do a stool PCR? Uh, and then, of course, the feasibility and commercial availability. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I think currently the guidelines suggest it's just the MP um, nasopharyngeal swab, and that's for discharge. But um, in, in our hospital, um, what we found was that patients who may have a negative throat swab or respiratory sample, we actually found positive PCR in the stool that lasts longer, maybe a week or so. So I, I suspect this may not be necessary for everybody, but in IBD cases, it's so difficult to differentiate between like what Rupa was saying, some people who don't have any of the COVID-related symptoms, but just like IBD flat, but was positive, I would have a very low threshold to perform a stool PCR. Um, we use our own in-house SARS-CoV-2 um, stool PCR, but I believe there are commercial one available as well that could be um, easily um, used. Commercial ones are available. Any other inputs from anyone else about this before I close it? Because we are now uh, close to 7.45. Yes, 7.45. Anyone else? Yes, uh, sir, I have some questions. Sir. Partner, yeah. Yes. So, uh, is there any um, role of ca fecal calprotectin in differentiating uh, this uh, COVID-19 GI presentation and uh, versus flare of IBD? No, I think it, you can't because um, the Austrian group found that patients with COVID-19 who are non-IBD have raised a fecal protecting just to suggest they have information. I think it's just a marker information. Can't tell you whether it's IBD or COVID in the gut. Okay, uh, I have another question for uh, Professor CJ. That uh, um, we have uh, recent studies have shown that the patients who are on infliximab, they have reduced immunogenicity to uh, this COVID vaccines. So, uh, if the uh, two doses of our vaccines are taken more than eight weeks apart, it has been seen that the immunogenicity is less. So, in India, uh, because th we have two vaccines, uh, Covaxin and Covishield, uh, one of them already it's recommended that it has to be taken more than three months apart. So, will that make a difference in ch uh, choice of vaccines in these patients? Uh, well, at least in, yeah, at least in the studies that have uh, the limited number of patients that have been subjected to uh, a strict regime versus those who are not. Uh, patients who adhere to the strict regime have better uh, uh, immunogenicity early. Um, so I guess it depends on how precious that patient is. When uh, That means if they are disease state, their comorbidities, uh, have, there are a lot of significant issues and uh, you really want to get their, 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 their numbers really high right from the beginning so that it's protective. But I understand that uh, sometimes the, the reality on, on the ground is different. So we just have to make do with whatever that's made available. Because sometimes like in Singapore, we have no choice. The, the government decides uh, when, when you come for your next dose. Um, you, you know, it, it goes by a certain regime and all that. And they are learning like uh, Moderna used to be four weeks and Pfizer used to be three. And I think uh, they've kind of followed the, the, the British example that we uh, extend it to six and eight weeks respectively for uh, Pfizer and Moderna. But uh, I guess for the patients who are on infliximab and all that, I think if we can make a case or if the vaccines are available commercially and you could buy privately, I think you will make a case to get them uh, dosed very, very close together according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendation. Uh, I would like to have an input here. Uh, the input is that in all vaccines, like, you know, the Covaxin or the Covishield, uh, Covishield uh, has been, is akin to AstraZeneca. And AstraZeneca has shown that after four weeks, the antibody response rate is about 55% but it goes up to 80% if you increase the dose to 12-week interval. So 
if people have actually received at four weeks, the question is also which we are considering now is whether we give a booster for them. Like, you know, with hepatitis B vaccine, where we gave zero, one and three months or zero, one and six months, because from long term immunogenicity, it may be required, a booster may be required in these situations. So we have to be aware that the shorter the duration between the second dose and the third, first and the second dose, lesser is the immunogenicity of a molecule. Yeah, so, so we, in fact, we had this, I had this discussion with the infectious disease specialist today. And we are talking about in our patients with uh, or, uh, either immunomodulators or biologics. Uh, should they get a third dose? And most of us agree that they should get a third dose. Question is, uh, in Singapore, we're governed by uh, Ministry of Health. So we, we haven't come to that yet. But I think soon after we vaccinated the whole population, we're going to make a case for booster dose for special uh, uh, populations like this. Yeah, just uh, just to add, we have a uh, twelve thousand seven hundred healthcare workers which we are taking care of during this COVID pandemic. So about fifty percent have received their vaccination at four weeks interval. So we are worried whether they are actually sufficiently protected. So we are doing a study to assess their antibody levels and. Actually, there is no protective antibody level which has been defined now in the community. So if we find most of them are not responding, we are planning to give them a booster and see what is going to be their response. Uh, I have one last question for Professor Sue. Are there any is increased risk of surgical complications like thrombotic complications after recovery from COVID-19 in patients with IVD? Uh, I think at the moment that there, there, there isn't any just because of COVID-19, once they recover, they recover. But for all surgical, because it's an infectious state, there's high risk, so always use uh, prophylaxis for um, um, what we would normally use, prophylaxis, um, subcut collapsing for all these patients who are having surgery because they're high risk enemy, not necessarily because of COVID. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think it's been a very uh, useful uh, discussion. I know that it's getting to be late in the night in Far East and uh, uh, here in India, we may be early in the evening, but I think uh, with all due respect, um, uh, we need to wind up because we've finished exhausted our one and a half hours. It's now more than one and a half hour, one hour, 45 minutes. But I think uh, you would all agree with me that uh, it was an evening well spent in understanding and making uh, and getting a very clear picture as to what COVID and IBD should be all about. And I think all the questions that were laid out in the beginning have been answered to a certain to, to a large extent with a great degree of clarity. Uh, with this, uh, I now request my co-moderator, Dr. Jayanti, for the closing remarks as well as introducing the next uh, episode of IBDENs. Over to you, Dr. Chair. Can you introduce the next topic? Yes, Dr. Rupa, could you just show us the, uh, yeah. Can you the just poster show us for the next, next one? Next slide, next slide. Yeah. Well, you see that, uh, yeah, could you have the slide? Yeah. Uh, the next slide. Uh, the, the next session of IBD ENC, we are going to look at IBD in children. And uh, we are going to focus our attention on diagnostic and management parent. Uh, we have finalized the program and we shall definitely come up with uh, the details in due course of time. But till then, I think uh, you can block your date, uh, which is mentioned here. And uh, uh, it, till then, of course, uh, it's Bye from me, but over to Dr. Jayanti for the first book. Thank you all. Um, on behalf of IBD uh, ENC, um, we wish to thank our guest speakers, Dr. CJ, as well as Dr. Sue, for the wonderful talks, and our moderator, Dr. Iger, for taking us through two inter uh, interesting case scenarios, and uh, to our panelists who uh, interacted. Uh, so, uh, very nicely with the moderator as well as with the uh, questions and answer session. And we thank Dr. Usha, Dr. Malti, and Dr. Omar for this wonderful session. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, uh, that brings uh, down the curtains the on slides. yet another episode of IPD ENC. And of course, uh, let us not forget uh, Dr. Nilesh, uh, who, who, who gave us the Lankan glimpse. And uh, let me remind uh, Nilesh that we in 
Kerala, not very far off, just one hour away from Colombo. We're ready to jump across to uh, mm -hmm. Sri Lanka uh, soon after the COVID is over. Uh, looking forward to meeting you all in person at the earliest. And uh, I think with this formal closure, it is uh, time for just informal interaction. Yes, we will have IBDNC meetings in person in all these countries. And we are just taking a glimpse of that. Uh, yes, it's goodbye from here, but we, we cannot end without the last slide. And I would like uh, to thank... Uh, can I have it as the slide? I would like to thank our academic partners who do a, a phenomenal job in spreading out the word, sending out uh, the invites to all gastroenterologists across the region. Uh, and uh, I mentioned Dr. Reddy's labs, um, Micro Labs, Takeda, uh, for all the support and help they have provided in making this program a success. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.